Great, got it, okay. So please um, approve um, the recording so we can uh, share this with other members um, when, they, when, when we make this available um, to other people. So I just wanna let you know that um, we wanna thank um, the town, uh, acting town administrator, um, Charles Sumner and the members of the select board that are here, Rebecca Eldridge, who keeps the uh, trains running on time here in Wellfleet as it were um, for making this. And this meeting is being held in lieu of what would normally be our um, annual meeting. So as um, those of you who were here um, last summer probably already know um, because of COVID, we haven't had our usual programming during the summers where we meet in person and we haven't had um, the usual uh, annual meeting or um, the election for new officers and new board members. So hopefully um, this will happen um, next summer, but we will keep you, um, we will try to keep you informed um, during the year of everything that's going on with our um, newsletters and with um, e-blasts and other information as it um, comes along. Um, for those of you who haven't joined, um, I want to urge you that we're probably the best um, and cheap, one of the cheapest uh, bargains in town. So please um, go to, we, we still are using our old name, so it's wnrta.org um, to join the organization and um, be part of hopefully having um, at least some form of voice around what happens here in um, Wellfleet. So our hope for what would happen this meeting um, is for us to start with um, uh, some questions for uh, the acting town administrator, Charles Sumner, and then to move to the um, board members th that are here um, as quickly as possible. And then we will open it up to your um, questions. And um, the best way to do that, Rebecca, is I think to have people, hold on, let me just change this to gallery, um, to people to go to the um, reactions section. And um, you'll see a little, I'm sure most of you know this by now, having lived on Zoom for the last two years practically now, or at least a year and a half, there's a raise hand um, little thing under reactions. If you would raise your hand that way, Rebecca can uh, call on you and um, we will um, be able to move this along as quickly as possible. Okay, so um, I would like to um, start. Uh, and so the idea was this year, sometimes we, um, when we've had open meetings, we've tended to let the select board talk for a few minutes and then um, ask questions. What we'd like to do is we, the board has a couple of questions and we thought we would start with um, Charlie Sumner. Um, our acting administrator, and then um, ask uh, one question from each board member that's here that it came up during our board meetings, and then open it up to your questions um, um, for the rest of the um, time that we have. And I'm hoping that this will run much shorter than those of you who have been attending um, select board meetings know they go for four hours, sometimes even longer. I promise you, we will not do that. You might even be able to get to ice cream before the end of the meeting with any luck, um, or at least watermelon with your family. So um, I would like to start with um, Charlie Sumner, who's our acting um, administrator. And Charlie, I'd like you to just tell people where we are around some of the um, questions that were raised earlier this year about um, the audit and what's happening financially um, in the town. That seems to me one of the biggest questions everybody seems to have. So if you wouldn't mind speaking to that, we would appreciate it. Okay, um, thank you very much, Susan. And um, just hello to everyone. Um, my name is Charlie Sumner. Uh, I've been serving as your interim town administrator uh, since the middle of May 2021. And just for background purposes, I, I did serve as, the, as a local town administrator in Massachusetts for about 38 years, 30 of them um, in Brewster, and I retired back in 2016. Um, so um, anyway, uh, that's a little bit about my background. Now, um, obviously, the, there was a vacancy um, in the town administrator's position. I was approached by the select board to see if I'd be interested in serving on a temporary interim basis. And I'm you know, honored to serve as Wellfleet's um, town administrator. I, um, you know, obviously we received an audit um, last spring uh, that had some real, indicated some real significant issues and concerns. 
um, you know, one major uh, material witness relative to cash reconciliation uh, issues that frankly uh, have been not, not occurring properly. And then there were 13 other comments um, of varying degrees and issues within the uh, auditor's report. So um, that's sort of an outline of, of what we're dealing with. Now, I, I would just say, I don't wanna go on too long to it. I know you have a lot of other things to deal with, but um, you know, in reality, the town um, migrated to a new software platform uh, it's called Vadar back in uh, July 1st, 2019. And I think that really that's the genesis of the problem um, here. Um, and then when you add into uh, that um, action that occurred back then, you had a, a, lot, a big turnover in staff, a lot of retirements, resignations, you know, several town accountants, a few town administrators. And you had a lot of new people step into some of the major financial roles. So it, it appears to me, and, and I think the reality is when you go back to July 1st, 2019, when we uh, unveiled the new software platform, you know, you know it, it was flawed from the beginning because proper beginning account balances uh, weren't uh, addressed in the initiation of the uh, new program. And hence, uh, we've had, you know, ongoing numerous uh, issues uh, relative to um, count balances, reconciliations, a whole host of things. Now, someone did say to me, oh, Charlie, what's wrong with VADAR? And, and I would just say to you, nothing. Um, you know, um, VADAR is a pretty substantive company. They provide support services to, I think, over 80 uh, Massachusetts customers. And Frankly, uh, Brewster, where I worked, uh, uses, uses VADAR, and uh, Chatham, I know, uses VADAR. I, I know that in the Cape. And you know, both those communities are AAA-rated communities, and we're very happy uh, with the product. Brewster has used VADAR since 2005. Um, so you know, anyway, here we are. Uh, we have a, an audit that, uh, concerning a number of issues. Uh, the board uh, did hire me. And then I immediately hired two um, uh, retired finance professionals. Professionals, Lisa Sauve was the finance director in Brewster. She worked with me for over 28 years. Lisa's retired, I hired Lisa. Um, she had been working here for a while last year anyway, had left. And then when I came on board, she agreed to come back. And then Mary McIsaac, uh, is also another um, Cape-based retired finance professional. She has a lot of um, experience in uh, treasury collection. Her last um, full-time position was the finance director for Barnstable County. So these two women really, in my mind, are part of the solution. And they're really more important um, in this process than I am. Um, so uh, what we've done um, in working with the select board is we have created a work plan. We've taken all the comments that were identified in the um, in the audit for power by Powers and Sullivan, and we've structured those and tried to prioritize those. And we're attacking them, um, you know, one by one. Um, and um, and then we're going to report to the select board um, really at each of their meetings. And if you think about the select board meetings, they've had. COVID updates, because COVID's been a critical public policy uh, health issue in our community. And uh, the chair, uh, Ms. Ryan Curley, has agreed to have the financial update um, discussion as another premier part of the selectman's agenda. So we'll report every two weeks um, on the, the efforts that we're making uh, on attacking these issues. And, you know, someone said, oh, Charlie, you know, you know, how long is this gonna take? And, and right now I, I don't really have a good answer on that. Um, we, in because if you think about the effort that we're about to undertake, we really need to do a, a forensic review of all accounts. We wanna reconcile year end balances. And right now we're focusing on uh, going back two years. So there really is a significant effort um, that's gonna occur, but the goal is, um, there's been a lot of journal entries, account coding problems, um, endless um, issues that we're trying to deal with. And, and you know, it's sort of like pulling a, you know, the, 
end of a yarn on a sweater and unraveling it. We just have to follow that until we um, find uh, you know, all the issues and concerns and take corrective actions. But we really have made a fair amount of progress um, in, in terms of a number of the special uh, uh, accounts that we've been working on relative to um, stabilization funds, OPEP stabilization fund, many, many other issues with reconciled the debt budget, outstanding receivables and tax liens. The other thing uh, that we had to do is let's face it, we all walked in here um, in May and you had a town meeting on uh, June 26th. And thanks to a number of volunteers that stepped in, um, a budget and a warrant was put together. Um, special mention to Harry Tarkani and, and Dan Silverman, your moderator. Um, who really did a lot of work on the warrant and the budget. So we were able to put a budget together that frankly still, um, have, I still have some concerns about. Um, I still have to do some work on that, uh, but it was as good as could be done in a really tight, narrow time frame. Lisa Sauvey has taken the appropriations uh, plan that was established on June 26th. She's established a new chart of accounts uh, that's consistent with the um, state's UMass accounting system and the BADAR system. And so, you know, department heads uh, will start to receive monthly um, printouts on, on their budgets and they haven't received any monthly uh, budget uh, reports for, for over two years. Uh, wow. Because remember I told you the um, BADAR system wasn't set up properly from the beginning. So anyway, we, you know, that, that, that's gonna change right now uh, this month. Um, and we have all those issues in place. We're slowly working with the department heads to train them on, you know, coding of their bills so that we can give them, you know, good quality reports on uh, their budgets and revenue uh, status within their budget. So it's all, it's been a fair amount of work. And uh, thanks to the efforts of um, Mary and Lisa, I feel like we're making uh, pretty good progress. And maybe I'll just stop, Susan, right there, if that's okay. okay and, um, sure. There's a lot more, but I think that's a good summary for the moment. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. So let me just go through some of the other questions that have been raised by the board, and then we'll open it up um, to the membership. So um, Ryan, as the chair, I have a question for you. Um, one of the things that's been the, one of the positive things of having um, the COVID situation has been that it's been easier for those of us who aren't here full time to attend. Um, the board of selectmen, uh, the select board, sorry, select boards meetings um, over time. So we were curious, um, hopefully if we go back to your meeting um, in person, do you have any sense of whether it would be possible to continue to have a kind of hybrid meeting so that we could, I mean, I know you can watch it on the closed circuit thing, but it would be easier if we could respond. When you watch it, you can't say anything, but it's easier for us to be part of the meeting um, if it's on Zoom. So I don't know what the board's thoughts are on that going forward. Um, so I've already proposed policies to enable that. Um, they're, they're coming back on our agenda um, in for the September 14th meeting of the select board. Um, we have a a policy where we send our, you know, our proposed policies out for comment with the various boards and committees and departments in the town. Um, so it is possible. Um, you know, I, I, I can't really debate it too much right now. Um, but the, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible and, and hopefully we get there. So. Okay. Thank you. That would be really help. That would be really helpful because it makes it much easier for us, obviously, um, to um, participate, particularly when there's an issue of importance to us um, as well. So John Wolf um, is here. He's the newest member of the select board. So nice to meet you. Um, and so I have a question for you. Um, there has been a lot of concern about at least two incidents now of illegal. Um, cutting of, uh, of trees, um, one on the Old Wharf, um, the site at the corner of Old Wharf and Route 6, and then the one near LeCounts um, that were stopped by our building inspector. And um, I believe at least one of them is now in land court. So some of us were wondering what could be possibly done in the future so that 
the town doesn't have to spend money with lawyers to stop this um, from happening when it gets appealed? Are there ways in which you've thought about increasing the fines, for example, when people do this? Or what that you've thought about the, 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 these two major examples now of the illegal use of space? Well, uh, this has not so far since I've been on the board, which has been slightly over a month, uh, <laughs> has, <laughs> hasn't come before us yet. Uh, it may have before that I'm not aware of. Uh, I observed that uh, twice, at least in the case of the, uh, uh, the uh, LeCount's uh, Le Hollow Road uh, problem, uh, there were cease and desist orders which were violated. Mm -hmm. uh, so just on the spur of the moment, I really can't say that I have an answer for you. Okay. As to what could be done going forward. We were concerned. I mean, I'm part of the old wharf uh, neighbors that had to, in fact, raise money and hire a lawyer to try and um, stop this. So, I mean, it's our concern about what the role of the town is going to be going forward on this and also why the town would have to spend money, you know, for lawyers themselves, you know, to stop this kind of thing from happening. Uh, well, the town would, uh, the, the town is basically in charge of enforcing this uh, zoning regulations. So if those are being violated, uh, we would be in the position of having to, uh, I should think of having to uh, uh, legally enforce, uh, right. you know, to make these things stick in court. Um, I would certainly be in, on the surface of it without having looked into it to any great degree, I would be in favor of increasing fines for that kind of egregious, uh, Thumbing, thumbing of a of a collective nose in our faces. Right. We have these zoning regulations for a reason, and if uh, if the the uh, parties concerned want to change those, there are avenues for approaching us to try and do that if they think uh, that that's right. necessary. But violating the law isn't the way to do it. Right. I mean, I think you can understand for a lot of us who have tried to like build a bigger deck or replace a deck and have come up against the building codes um, and try to be really good citizens. It's a little frustrating to watch other people violate the rules when we all are trying very hard. <laughs> oh, I agree. And yeah, before I was on the board, it was frustrating to watch. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay, well, thank you. So um, Helen, I think Helen's here too. Um, so Helen, I have a question for you that came up. So we know that the town now is collecting um, short term rental um, taxes for people renting their their homes. And we also know that the town is getting presumably more money from the um, weed stores that now seem to be growing like weeds everywhere. <laughs> we uh, turn excuse the pun here. Um, so we were wondering whether or not there was any thought to using some of that money to affordable housing. You're right. muted, Helen. You're Helen, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, I do that so you don't have to listen to my cats yelling for supper. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yes, there's more than a thought. Um, and in fact, there's so much of a thought, uh, you know, to use that and other sources of revenue for affordable housing that you know, department heads have very reasonably said, hey, don't forget the general fund also needs some money too. So there's more than a thought. And we now have, it was a pass by town meeting. I think that was it, the end of it. Nobody else has to approve it. I'm trying to remember if the DOR has to sanctify it, that we have um, an affordable trust fund group. We have a trust fund, but, um, I would have loved the last question because I'm very deeply into it. And can I just say one thing about the tree cutting? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. On Pine Point Road in a neighborhood, you know, some new people moved in, nothing wrong with that. And they proceeded to cut a lot of trees, some of which were in the town's roads layout. And you know, I was very aware of all of that. I've got a friend who lives on that road. And what I want to recommend is without being intrusive or bad neighbor vibe, if you're all living together in a place, you're sharing those trees, even if they're on somebody's private property, but you're really sharing them if they're within the town way. And if I saw 
that kind of activity beginning to happen, I would relax my body, get my best manners together and go over and say, hi, do you know that? In other words, before right. the trees got cut down. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you for letting me say that because- uh, Sure. I, 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 I understand that the problem is, as you know, with Old Wharf is they bought the land on Friday and clear cut everything on Saturday in the middle of January. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even a chance for anybody to put their body in front of a bulldozer. It, it just wasn't possible. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I have two more questions before we open it up. Um, one question has to do, some of us couldn't make the uh, meeting on Tuesday night. So we'd like to know what's happening with the bike um, trail situation. What was the report from the um, bikeways committee and where do you think we are around the issues of the, uh, the extension of the bike trail? Ryan, you want to get that? Okay. Um, so we had uh, the bike and walkways committee present um, uh, a series of their recommendations. Um, basically, I mean, the, the DCR has said that they are currently stopping the bike trail at the campground um, and they don't have uh, funding lined up um, to extend it to um, Route 6 and it's not in their capital plan currently. Um, it is kind of in the town's, um, I don't know, it, it's kind of been sent to the town to figure out if there is an alternative route that's acceptable um and it, it's going to take a while um for us to get there but the bike and walkways um report was a good start so if that answers that so is so just to follow that up quickly that means that the parking area that was being cleared on route six is just going to stay like that for right now yeah so i this is something that i, I don't understand why they did it when they did um so they they had it to basically as an equipment lay down uh yard for the the various machinery um being used for for the bike trail but it doesn't really connect to the bike trail right. so i'm not really sure why they did that um when they did it so okay uh, okay so one last question before I open it up, and I don't know which one of you. So one of the questions we we all of us have been obviously concerned about what happened with the overwash at um, Duck Harbor, so that we had a uh, much larger mosquito problem um, than before. And our understanding, at least from some of the public discussion, has been there was some issues around permitting that didn't allow it to be addressed um, quickly enough. Do we have any sense of what's going to happen around the possibility of that kind of overwash and the mosquito um, explosion going forward? Well, right now, the Cape Cod Mosquito Control Project has the permits in place. Um, but John's brought it up um, and wants it on an agenda um, in the near future um, to help the Mosquito Control Project to access some of these some of these locations to uh, treat the situation. And I'll just let the I see John has his hand up. So <laughs> yeah, John, do you want to go ahead and then and then Helen? Sure. Um, uh, I reached out. Uh, about 10 days ago to uh, Gabrielle Sirkolsky, who was the head of Cape Cod Mosquito Control, uh, to get a better sense of um, what is being done. I, I had been given to understand that the uh, seashore, after many years of refusal, finally gave permission to Cape Cod Mosquito Control to apply larvicide uh, in the Herring River area. And uh, in the course of our conversation, it came out that what they are not doing is allowing mosquito control to cut um, uh, footpaths into the key areas of Herring River uh, in order to actually do their job. So what I'm proposing to do is to bring both uh, Gabrielle and also uh, Brian from to the table at a, at a future meeting 
to try and address that and come to a meeting of the minds. Uh, I, I can think of no good reason why they are being refused access. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And Helen, did you wanna add something else before I open it up? I certainly do. I spent, oh, close to two hours listening to Jeff Saunders from the National Seashore, uh, who is very much on this issue and spent time in the last week getting the entomologist for uh, Barnesville County, Larry Dapsness, and Gabriel, Gabriel uh, Sikalski, and Jeff, and John Portnoy, who studied mosquitoes for years for the park together, communicating in a good way horizontally about this. And where we are as of today is the park is very much looking at how to open it up. And John is right. Um, it's more about access to the places where you would apply BTI, which is a larvicide, not a pesticide that's a chemical, and also sometimes oil. I've had both of them applied at the back of my property. It's not like some of the pesticides that are being used by some of the companies around here. And these people are all gonna give uh, an intense session on Sunday at the Gupaka organization, which is the neighborhoods around the ponds. So if any of you are part of Gupaka, you're in for not a treat, but you're in for a good dose of information about it. Punchline, the park is really open to working with this, with the mosquito control project. Great. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Rebecca, do you wanna call on people whose hands are up then? Sure, right now, just Carlos Molina's hand is up. Okay. Mr. Molina, it's all yours. Or do we lose him? He's there, he just needs to unmute. Yes, please unmute yourself so we can hear your question. <laughs> okay, I'm ready to go. Uh, yeah, it's an old question. I'm just wondering if you can bring me up to date. The issue of uh, this uh, residence, uh, seasonal residents having equal rights in the town, such as voting, uh, running for office, et cetera. Well, um, I, let me just quickly say, we, we held a session actually on this um, in 2018, I believe, um, around the issue. So let me just say briefly, as a historian, we obviously don't want to go back to what the United States did at the beginning of this country, which is only white men under over 21 who owned property um, were allowed to vote. So the question of whether or not you can vote in two places is still debated in many different um, places across the country. And the issue of, um, in some communities, people are allowed to vote on financial things if they own property in the town, but in general, it's a one person, one vote situation um, across the country. So um, that's kind of where we are legally um, at, at the moment around that. And, and Helen has her hand up if you wanna say anything more about that. Yeah, what's important, and I have to tell you, I do love, I do appreciate this association. You guys are so great over the years. And you're truly part of the input that we get. Um, Wellfleet is uh, unusual, but very practical in that we allow people who are not registered voters here to um, participate on boards and committees. You can't be on an elected uh, committee. We call everything committee now as per the charter. So I'm on a committee that's called the select board and a couple of other things. And I have to live here. I have to be domiciled here. But if you wanted to serve on the planning board or you wanted to serve on you know, an advisory committee, you'd have to honor the commitment. You can't miss meetings. Um, you, know, you have to work hard at it. And I just wanna say that you have equal voice. If you don't vote here, you still have equal voice. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if you spend time here on the land, you have standing and you should have standing, not just if you're a taxpayer, but if you're here in part of the community. But I agree very much with what um, Susan said. You know, you get one vote and you have to choose. Thank you. 
Thank you. To the question, if I may, to the question to the serving of uh, boards and committee, I mean, it's, um, it, it, I mean, this past year I was here eight out of the 12 months, uh, but this is a new era. This is a new time. Uh, and the issue as, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't re uh, uh, Susan said regarding the next select board meeting uh, that will be in person, if they could make it a hybrid and allow for Zoom meeting. So I, I would recommend that the same process um, and, and availability uh, would be extended to committee work. So because someone could be devoted, hardworking, uh, like I said, in this day and age, if it wasn't for Zoom, many companies would have closed shop. Right. Okay, thank you. That's a useful, I'm sure they'll discuss it. So uh, Rebecca, do you wanna call on uh, other people whose hands are up? Sure, Tom has his hand up right now. He just needs to unmute. There we go. You got me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to the elected officials and uh, Charles, um, you got a tough job ahead of you and I appreciate everything you're doing for the town. Uh, it's uh, it's un un uncharted waters and, uh, you know, good luck with trying to move everything forward and uh, we support you. So thanks for that. Um, the purpose of me being on, I wanted to just give some brief comments uh, at the Board of Selectmen meeting on Tuesday night. Uh, Peter Cook, uh, head of the Bike and Walkway Committee, presented the uh, Bike and Walkway recommendations. And uh, I just want to give some comments and some facts and, uh, you know, actually ask the, the, the board for some support. I know uh, Helen's missing and uh, I think Michael's missing, but that's okay, John. No, Ryan, Helen's here. Helen's right here. I Helen's got three, here. Of you. Three, three out of five. We're good. Thank you. Right. We have but, three out of uh, five. Right. And any, anyway, net net is... Uh, uh, I'm a property owner here in Wellfleet and I own land under the power lines and uh, the bike and walkway committee uh, categorizes that as the utility right away. And uh, I sort of represent a number of the people uh, under the power lines. I have been very active in the last five years. And John, I did watch the board of selectmen meeting and I do want to let you know, I've been on the committee this past year and uh, I've attended probably 75% of the meetings. And each and every time I voiced my concern and requested that the protection of private property take place. So just to frame this for all the WS, SR, WSRA members, um, the Bike and Walkway Committee came up with a plan and uh, specifically it highlights the utility corridor, which is basically Cahoon Hollow Road North. And just to put a framework around this, um, there are 15 properties from Cahoon Hollow Road to Long Pond. Those are my neighbors. I've looked at the assessor's records and what have you, and I've been very active in talking to them. 75% of those folks have said, we don't want a bike path on our private property. And John and Ryan, you maybe aren't aware of this, but in 2019, there was a, a campaign, Helen, you received some of the letters, but this same group um, sent notes to the Board of Selectmen as well as the Bike and Walkway Committee saying, hey, you know, please, please take notice of this. So it's not like, you know, they just saw the report and said, hey, we don't want it. Uh, they've been pretty active and I've been active on the committee. Um, I actually submitted two proposals for alternatives. Um, listen to Mr. Listening to Mr. Karlstrom and Ryan's comments about land swapping and stuff. I don't know if the National Seashore is a, a realistic uh, opportunity, but I, I'm, I'm keeping an open mind. Uh, one of my proposals actually that I submitted to the Bike and Walkway Committee is on the Eastern Corridor, which was done in, uh, I think it was uh, 2008. And uh, it goes up to the National Seashore and what, east of the power lines. So we'll see what happens with that. But um, anyway, I, I, I think, you know, I, I've given you a little bit of background, uh, you know, and, and the members have been pretty vocal about, you know, opposing this. Um, when, when you look at some of the activities that we've been in, and I look at some of the things the Bike and Walkway Committee did, um, I don't think they weighed enough on private property uses. Um, it was, well, you know, it's down the food chain and it should be really high on the list. Private property is very important to all of us. I think that's really important. Um, one thing I don't want to have happen here, and I feel like this 
I, I, I don't know, I don't feel good about it, is we all recall what happened with the DCR in the town and myself were very active in pushing back uh, on safety issues and what they were doing and trying to get town input. And uh, they felt like, uh, I guess the town and myself included felt they weren't listening. Well, I gave you all the activities that I've been involved in and those folks that live on the power lines with the letters and, you know, in February, actually, February of this past year, there was a forum that the bike and walkway committee did, Helen attended, and there was four of us that attended, all said the same thing. You know, we don't want our private property to be used. Oh, is that my ding, Susan? No, it's, um, <laughs> uh, no, it, but you're getting close to it. Yeah, so you I'm want done. to wrap up I'm almost, question. I'm almost done, but I guess my point okay. is, that, is that we've been vocal, we've been in front of it. Uh, I've been on the committees trying to, one, represent private property interests, but also trying to give other ideas of what we can do. Um, I just think it's a bad precedent for the select board to support something that would deal with the taking of private property. And I think people have been pretty vocal about that. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the DCR looked at the power lines, the utility right of way, and on three separate occasions, they said no. Why? Private property, ADA requirements, and costs. And uh, I disagree with Peter's comments about, you know, the ADA requirements uh, using switchbacks. Uh, but we can talk about that at a board of select or a bike and walkway committee meeting. But more importantly, when you suggest switchbacks on some of these dunes in the power lines, Eversource, I have a problem thinking that Eversource is going to improve any kind of land movement or manipulation of the main source of power to the outer cape. Okay. So I just wanted to get that out. Uh, sorry to be long winded. But All I missed right. the meeting on Tuesday. And Ryan, thank you for dealing with me, John and Helen. Um, you've seen my letters, all our letters. And uh, we just ask for your support, not that that piece going up utility lines. We ask for your support and not not supporting that. Thank you. I think, I think people don't understand that there is private property under the lines. So that's been, I think, confusing for a lot of people here. So yeah. I appreciate that. John, did you have your hand up? Did you want to add something here? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I certainly appreciate your concerns, uh, Mr. Shard. Um, and it, basically, where I come out so far, and I, I, uh, we have a lot yet to, to, to turn over in our minds and publicly on this. Um, what I don't want to see is the, bar, uh, the bike trail come out onto Route 6 in a hazardous location. Agreed. <clears throat> now, as to al alternate routes, I've been getting quite a bit of feedback independently of, you know, of the select board or, or you know, public forums uh, by uh, people who largely are people who have been here all their lives mm -hmm. and who value the, uh, you know, the secret, I guess you could call them the secret places out there in the woods, yeah. the dirt roads, the fire roads. And, yeah. and I've been hearing a lot about, you know, we don't want uh, uh, the woods paved over. Yeah. So it's going to take some, some, uh, some doing to find a suitable alternative that, that leaves the private property alone, which I, 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 I agree, we should not be in the business of taking private property for this, in my opinion. I'm not speaking for the board when I say I understand. That. I understand. Just yeah. speaking for myself. Yeah. Um, uh, but there has to be a way uh, to compromise, uh, especially uh, regarding the use of some of these uh, uh, areas. Perhaps to bring it out to the highway at Gull Pond Road or, yeah. or you know one of those alternatives. Yeah. I have not spent enough time studying. I, I have to hand it to the Bike and Walkways Committee. They did a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. And I, I, I have not finished going through all of it myself. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you okay. for your comment. Thank you. Other questions? Um, this is your chance to. Um, um, so there's another hand up, I think. Uh, yes, Rebecca. I have Irene Goldman up. And then thank you. Kevin. Sure. So I uh, apologize in advance. I'm on my phone because I somehow my reception is poor. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you so much. First of all, to my home team here, the now WSRA, a great organization, been a member since its founding. 
and to the select board for uh, for joining us this evening. And I was really glad to hear Ms. John's comments uh, just now. I am at 25 Queens Way <clears throat> and my property goes to the National Seashore. <clears throat> Over the property are power lines. And I agree with everything that Tom said, please excuse me. <clears throat> it's a, a big misconception in the public, I think, that when you say right of way, uh, people think that's public property. And in fact, it's a right of way that's only granted to the uh, utility company. <clears throat> so my point is, uh, you've seen my, the select board has received letters over the years. Uh, I had not been personally as active because of deaths in my family and other illnesses, but I am here and I'm happy for Zoom because it allows me to participate more often. And I hope that we will do so in the future. I categorically object to uh, the use of the power line <clears throat> for for the uh, and taking the private property of the residents. It is not a public right of way, and and I look forward to participating with Tom's guidance as well. And Tom has been extremely helpful in all of this and keeping me up to date. So I, I look forward to continuing my participation and to finding a better way. And I think we can do it. Okay. So thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Kevin is up next. Hey everybody, um, I'm Kevin. I'm over on Browns Neck Road and um, behind me is uh, Poldyke. And we are um, uh, fortunate to be near the Herring River. Um, wondering and have seen the documentation, have received paperwork from the, from the city and the town regarding uh, the Herring River project. And just wanted to get our realistic um, a timeline of when this work might happen of raising the road back there. Thank you. Helen, can you answer that? Yeah. Okay. Um, right now, um, the Herring River uh, technical team, which I am privileged to sit in on, not as a member of it, uh, is in further stages of orchestrating, permitting, getting funding, and looking at the possibility of maybe starting construction in 2022. Um, there are a lot of factors that that depends on. Um, in the first two years, once, and it could happen while the Herring River what's now the Herring River Dyke Bridge is being built, um, the vegetation management could happen. That has to be carefully coordinated. But to get to your question, raising the roads has to happen before you start opening the gates, obviously. And there are a number of steps to doing that. And it has to do in some instances with the park and the town figuring out how to have it happen on property that is sometimes a little bit on the parks, uh, you know, side of a boundary line. And it's kind of like housekeeping, but one of the things the select board has to focus on before those roads can get raised is if we want to do land swaps for that. Um, in other words, it could happen within the next five years, but it depends on so many things that I can't give you a straight answer right now about it, but you see why. It's not because it's a secret. It's because there are so many moving parts right now. I hope that doesn't dissatisfy you too much. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So I don't see any hands raised, except Helen, go ahead. Yeah, I want to act, uh, ask, uh, add a couple of facts to the um, bike trail controversy. Um, three things. Uh, in 2017, um, the Cape Cod Commission said that this section of Wellfleet, which is very controversial, having the bike trail go through it 
needed further study, further evaluation, more detailed evaluation. Those are their exact words. And this study by the Bike and Walkways Committee did that in a fully professional way. That said, they have their recommendations, but the study as a whole puts out a lot of options and assesses them. And that is what is of value to me about it. And yes, of course, I'm very concerned about the private property you know, invasion of that, particularly because people that live along that easement and have property on that easement are subjected to routine cyclical pesticide application by, you know, Eversource. <laughs> and that's a real invasion of private property, you know. Um, and I get it. And I'm very much against that. But we should all take a look at your leisure if you're so concerned about it. Read the whole report and look at the way in which they assessed all the different parts of what might be a bike trail. It's way more than what goes past, you know, those 15 property owners. There are other options. Thank you. Uh, Carlos has his hand up again. And no, then Dave, Dave, Dave Garrison Dave is, Garrison is waving. So yeah, how about we Dave, Dave go first? Sure, your call. Okay, Dave. <coughs> Thank Sorry. you very much, Susan. It's a delight to see you. Um, <laughs> Dave Garrison, um, our family owns the property on Duck Pond. <coughs> Um, actually, we're coming up on a 90th or so uh, of having that property and being a steward of the of the pond for this long time. I, I want to raise a question about the bike path uh, to the select board uh, members here. Uh, the, there's a lot of issues associated with the public access to the pond and the damage is done to the pathway and so forth. And I won't go into those, but the main concern I have at the moment regarding the path, the bike path is that the current terminus, I know it's not supposed to be the permanent one, but the current terminus for the light path is at the campground, which is a hop, step, and a jump over from the pathway down to the pond. And it seems to us pretty clear that the thousands of people who are going to be riding their bicycles up to the far end of the, of the bike path just to see where it ends up. And, and, they, and the word's going to get out that when they get there, they only have to go a short distance over and go down to the pond and have a swim, presumably with their bicycles down this pathway, which is eroding down into a gully, right? It's a, I'm worried that, th that there's going to be a period of time here during which all of this traffic is coming up, back, up, up, up on the bike path where there's going to be a huge jump in the usage of the pond. And I'm a pleading with the town officials to take that proposition seriously and to do something about trying to manage this flow. I don't think you can stop it, not so long as that's the terminus, but there are things you can do to manage the, the access to the pond and how the pond is used on the public uh, beach over there, and whether bicycles are allowed down on that pathway and, uh, and on and on. So, I mean, I think most everybody here instinctively understands what the issue is. So I, I'm using this opportunity, Susan, just to ask, it sounds like jo, well, both uh, Helen and John have spoken to this thing, is to think about that problem. And I don't know whether the Bike Waste Committee is you know, focused on this sort of stuff or whether that flops over to the beach planner crowd or what it is, but I, I really feel that it's a danger to this really special place uh, uh, called Duck Pond. Anyway, thank you for letting me have my two cents. Sure. Does anybody want to respond? Mm -hmm. Helen and John both have their hands up. Okay, John, do you want to start? I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I, not having actually seen that for myself, I'll take your word for it that uh, that is the situation with that path. Uh, and I think there are ways to manage it, but I would suggest, and I've suggest, I think I made the suggestion at our Tuesday night meeting too, when we were discussing the bike path is that uh, those who have concerns like this, I don't know if you've done this or not, but uh, some of the people I've talked to have not. And that is to attend bike and walkways meetings, they're public meetings. And um, uh, it would, I think be useful for them to have that input on a regular basis. 
uh, I'm not, I, I don't think I should speak for, you know, what we might do as a board, but I will say uh, for myself that, you know, I've heard, I hear your concern and I expect we will address it in some fashion. Alan, did you want to respond to? Yes. Um, have no fear, Mr. Garrison. The you know 900-pound gorilla in the room, our dear National Seashore, is very concerned about impact on Gulf Pond. Okay, so nobody is thinking that this campground, which already causes a lot of use of Duck Pond, which I've gone to my whole life, um. One of the things about having a bike trail continue through to Truro is that it gives people the opportunity if they, they use that grid of roads that goes between Route 6 and Ocean View Drive to access four ocean beaches along Ocean View Drive and all those other ponds. In other words, it spreads the use out and that happens up to a point now. My sense is that because there already is an existing campground there that's been used, heavily used for years, that having the terminus be there uh, temporarily, right, is not something that's going to continue as a situation where there's greater impact on Duck Pond. Unfortunately, all our ponds, are getting more use, even the ones deep in the woods. And just as someone who is very familiar with bicycling and Wellfleet, let's leave it at that. Um, taking a bike, like a road bike that isn't a dirt bike, I don't mean a motorized one, I mean, you know, one for trails and stuff, down that long road to the public landing on, um, Gulp, on Duck Pond, I would just go to Great Pond or something if I was on a bike, and many people do. So that's my take on it now, but have no fear. The National Park Service is much more concerned than anybody at this meeting about Duck Pond. Trust me, even you, Mr. Garrison, you should hear them. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so let's call on, on people who haven't spoken, and then we'll come back to Mr. Molina. Uh, Donald Thomas is on. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am just recently uh, now an official member of the seasonal uh, residence committee. Uh, for years, I've been a full-time resident of, of Wellfleet for many years. I'm looking at the bike path uh, project as a project in the way I looked at projects when I was working project composed of three elements, time, cost, and the requirements. What the Bike and Walkway Path Committee has done very clearly and well is present some alternative requirements and spell them out and give us different options and uh, aspects of them. What we haven't seen is for each of these alternatives, what is the cost and how long would it take to achieve it? The costs are just taking of properties. The costs are significant construction costs. You can see the construction they've done to extend the rail trail from LeCount Hollow to the camp, uh, campground there. It's significant. It's a significant cost to maintain bike paths, to maintain the flashing lights at any road crossings. And is the town of Wellfleet in a position to take on those expenses as well as the expense of building this and if necessary, buying properties, buying land. So we're looking at a project that's much bigger in scope than just coming up with a new path. And I think the Bike and Walkways Committee has done the job of presenting some alternatives. Now there's got to be a fairly in-depth long-term project 
to determine what is really feasible. And bottom line is, is it actually feasible at all to create a rail trail or bike path from Wellfleet through Truro? Through Truro? We might find out it's not really feasible. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, but we have to think of what are the alternatives. One of the alternatives is presented by the DCR. Originally, I was totally against that, dumping people out on Route 6. By and large, it might be the best alternative to put a, have it end there with sufficient parking, put up big signs that say, do not cross Route 6 or go on to Route 6 at peril of being run over by a, a tractor trailer truck, <laughs> or uh, I don't know if there's sufficient parking at the campground, but let DCR do what they want. It's done. Let the uh, Department of Transportation fix Route 6 and resurface Route 6 from the uh, driving theater to Truro. That benefits all of the taxpayers and everybody else riding the road. You know, it's not, we're looking at a significantly large project to benefit bicyclists. Yeah. I'm getting to the age where I'm not bicycling anymore. And I, I'm sorry, I don't want to take any more time, but okay. I think we've got to step back. The board of selectmen, select persons, all taxpayers step back and look at what is real, what is realistic, what is within the scope of our public funding, our towns, you know, we're not going to get federal grants to build bike paths or take property or maintain. So let's, uh, that's my voice. Let's okay. step back and look at it again. Okay, thank you. Rebecca, you want to call on other people? Sure. Carlos Molina's had his hand up. Okay. And then Helen and John, I think, want to respond. And then, right. and then Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the mosquito control project. Now, um, Susan, I think you said that um, the paths leading to the problem have, uh, have not been allowed to be clear, uh, probably using the wrong terminology, but can you, one, can you amplify what you meant by that? And two, uh, what does that mean for, for us in terms of the mosquito problem and when will that be alleviated, if at all? It wasn't me, I think it was Helen. So Helen, do you wanna respond? Yeah, the issue is um, minimal access through brush needs to be cut so crews can get in to apply what they apply to various ditches, which have been there for a very long time. And that really is the issue for the park that, you know, bless their hearts, the park doesn't let you go in and cut their trees. That's complicated for them to get permitted. But the punchline, once again, is the park is willing and working on it and already some, uh, of the stuff they put in to uh, deal with the larvicides has been applied and it will continue. And this is just a very unusual summer anyway. Um, it's wetter than usual. And even though there are still some brackish water mosquitoes, according to what I heard earlier today from the experts, um, we're also experiencing the mosquitoes we usually get in a way that's unusual because of the actual weather we've had, not just because of the washover. That was gone into in great detail. Okay, thank you. I think John was next, right? Yep, yep. Uh, okay, well, I'll first quickly address the mosquito. Yeah, uh, but Helen's correct. It's the uh, uh, issue of cutting paths uh, uh, as, Ms. Sarkolsky pointed out to me some of the paths they would like to cut would go through the uh, trees and vegetation which were killed by the salt water that came in uh, during the duck, water, uh, duck harbor breach. 
And that, it seems odd that that would even be an issue, vegetation. Um, so that's, uh, that really does need to be addressed. Uh, and just a quick uh, uh, backpedal over to uh, Mr. T what Mr. Timas was saying. Uh, in addition to the three parameters you mentioned, there's a fourth one, and that is impact. Impact on the environment and impact on, uh, 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 on the residents who would be affected by the building a bike trail in the woods. So uh, the, these are factors that do complicate it and uh, should make us take a deep breath and really think hard about, uh, about all these alternatives. That's all, thank you. Bonnie Shepard is next. Bonnie, you just need to mute yourself. Unmute yourself. Uh, in case you can't tell, I'm not Bonnie Shepard. Uh, <laughs> she hasn't grown a beard. Um, David Holmes, for around just uh, <clears throat> my Zoom uh, died, so I'm uh, using hers. I want to come back to the bike path issue, and I want to second what uh, Donald Timas said. I think the uh, original proposal to bring the uh, bike path out to Route 6 is by far the best, the safest, and the only practical one. We asked a number of times last year when this came up if there was an alternative route, and we were told repeatedly that there was not a feasible re alternative route. So I would like to uh, give a different uh, evaluation of the bike, uh, the bike committee's work. They've done an enormous amount of work and have not come up with another feasible path. Uh, all they've managed to do is what abutters have typically do in uh, well fleet is to, is to delay or derail an otherwise good project. Uh, the, the DOT is going to uh, redo the uh, Route 6 area, which is going to include a bike path along Route 6, or, it, 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 you know, we have some discussion about it, but uh, it's going to include a, uh, a pedestrian cross light in that area. I don't know, I, I, we've been discussing this for a long time and I think my position is known, but I think there are a lot of people in Wellfleet who actually would like to see the, the bike path extended to Route 6. We just uh, didn't go to the, uh, uh, the work necessary to organize that part of opinion and the uh, abutters uh, who got themselves appointed to the bike path uh, did. That's all I want to say. Okay. I just want to um, suggest that we move on to other questions rather than the bike path. I mean, I, I know this is a deep concern to a lot of people here, but I want to see if there are other questions about other issues in town that people want to um, to raise while we have um, a few more minutes. Um, we, you know, we can go another 10 minutes or so. So are there other questions that have something to do with other than the bike path that anybody wants to ask about? Are there other hands up? I don't see any hands up right now. Um, actually, Kevin and Helen again. Okay, Kevin. Hi, um, regarding the affordable housing problem in this town, and I know that the, the at the last town meeting, there was some provisions changed for the uh, ADUs, the accessory dwelling units. And, um, and I'm wondering, are there any incentives available to homeowners um, like you know, low cost loans or anything to actually build these things out? Because of the because of the, uh, the restrictions on how they can be used, um, obviously you really can't make your money back. So I'm wondering how um, we as residents could help solve this problem. Great question, Helen. Or unless Ryan wants to get it, I've been talking a lot. Ryan, do you want to get this? Um, I could try. Um, so right now there isn't. Um, isn't funding available for for somebody to build a an ADU? 
Um, if they are building an affordable accessory dwelling unit, um, there are different ways to uh, receive funding for that. Um, in terms of, but you know, it has been something that's been discussed about, you know, what are funding priorities um, going forward? Um, and I know it's been discussed by the um, the Wellfleet Housing Trust, um, but we're. I mean, the housing trust is new as of last year um, with some bylaw changes at last town meeting. Um, so we're, we're still trying to figure out, um, you know, the funding um, and where it's going. Right now, it's uh, the, the housing trust is primarily funded through CPA funds, um, which that funding is restricted to um, affordable housing only. Um, so, and, and there are some tax incentives available if you have an affordable um, housing unit as well, if that makes sense. So, thank you. John, John has his hand up. Go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, uh, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought at town meeting we passed um, uh, an article that uh, provided funding for those or uh, yeah, funding for those who wish to uh, uh, install uh, innovative uh, nitrate mitigation uh, technology on their septic systems to bring them into compliance uh, so as to be able to accommodate uh, an ADU, um, uh, which would be one sort of incentive. I, I, I thought we passed that, but maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah, we, we passed that, um, but it's not specific to ADUs. Um, so uh, or an ordinary house, if anybody on here wants to upgrade their septic system, you might be able to get money through the town to get a um, higher performance septic system. So okay, if my anybody's mistake. interested. <laughs> my, my mistake, I thought it was somehow connected to the ADU. Yeah. Right. Ellen? Yeah, so um, Susan, I'm sorry. There were two things that were assumptions that were stated that I just like to correct about the bike trail. One okay. is that the town would be paying for the bike trail. I haven't heard that ever. The park might pay for it. And by the way, breaking news in the last week or so, there is a state source of funding for trails. And the national, the feds have a ways, you know, uh, a lot of money's been liberated for, with this new administration for ways, you know, uh, improving ways, trails in parks. And this came up at our select board meeting. But the main thing is nobody in all the time I've been going to these meetings and thinking about it has had any suggestion that the town would swap land for it or that the town would build the trails. The town might contribute to like improving some of these roads that already exist that go to Ocean View Drive, but that hasn't even been on the table yet. And this would only affect taxpayers in the sense that we pay you know, federal taxes and state taxes. So I just needed to correct that. Thank okay. you. Huh, thank you. Okay, um, so we've been going for an hour, for a little more than an hour. Are there other questions that people want to raise? I don't see any hands raised, Susan. Okay, um, well then if there aren't any other questions, I want to just take this opportunity to thank the select uh, board members who showed up. I want to thank um, the over 50 of you who are members of our organization who uh, showed up this evening um, on a lovely evening to um, sit in front of your uh, computers one more time uh, as we all have. And um, again, we really appreciate um, the cooperative nature of these conversations. And we hope that all of us continue to be um, even if we're not voting, we are certainly all citizens of this land and care deeply about what happens here, and we will continue to do so. So thank you very much for your time um, this evening, and we hopefully will see you all in person next year. Thank you. Thanks, thank Rebecca. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night.